IT was no very unusual thing for Mr. Lestrade, of Scotland Yard, to look in upon us of an evening, and his visits were welcome to Sherlock Holmes, for they enabled him to keep in touch with all that was going on at the police headquarters. In return for the news which Lestrade would bring, Holmes was always ready to listen with attention to the details of any case upon which the detective was engaged, and was able occasionally, without any active interference, to give some hint or suggestion drawn from his own vast knowledge and experience. On this particular evening Lestrade had spoken of the weather and the newspapers. Then he had fallen silent, puffing thoughtfully at his cigar. Holmes looked keenly at him. Anything remarkable on hand, he asked. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes, nothing very particular. Then tell me about it. Lestrade laughed. Well, Mr. Holmes, there is no use denying that there is something on my mind. And yet it is such an absurd business that I hesitated to bother you about it. On the other hand, although it is trivial, it is undoubtedly queer, and I know that you have a taste for all that is out of the common. But in my opinion it comes more in Dr. Watson's line than ours. Disease, said I. Madness, anyhow. And a queer madness too. You wouldn't think there was anyone living at this time of day who had such a hatred of Napoleon I that he would break any image of him that he could see. Holmes sank back in his chair. That's no business of mine, said he. Exactly. That's what I said. But then, when the man commits burglary in order to break images which are not his own, that brings it away from the doctor and on to the policeman. Holmes sat up again. Burglary. This is more interesting. Let me hear the details. Lestrade took out his official notebook and refreshed his memory from its pages. The first case reported was four days ago, said he. It was at the shop of Morse Hudson, who has a place for the sale of pictures and statues in the Kennington Road. The assistant had left the front shop for an instant when he heard a crash, and hurrying in he found a plaster bust of Napoleon, which stood with several other works of art upon the counter, lying shivered into fragments. He rushed out into the road, but, although several passers-by declared that they had noticed a man run out of the shop, he could neither see anyone nor could he find any means of identifying the rascal. It seemed to be one of those senseless acts of hooliganism which occur from time to time, and it was reported to the constable on the beat as such. The plaster cast was not worth more than a few shillings, and the whole affair appeared to be too childish for any particular investigation. The second case, however, was more serious and also more singular. It occurred only last night. In Kennington Road, and within a few hundred yards of Morse Hudson's shop, there lives a well-known medical practitioner named Dr. Barnicott, who has one of the largest practices upon the south side of the Thames. His residence and principal consulting room is at Kennington Road, but he has a branch surgery and dispensary at Lower Brixton Road, two miles away. This Dr. Barnicott is an enthusiastic admirer of Napoleon, and his house is full of books, pictures, and relics of the French emperor. Some little time ago he purchased from Morse Hudson two duplicate plaster casts of the famous head of Napoleon by the French sculptor, Devine. One of these he placed in his hall in the house at Kennington Road, and the other on the mantelpiece of the surgery at Lower Brixton. Well, when Dr. Barnicott came down this morning he was astonished to find that his house had been burgled during the night, but that nothing had been taken save the plaster head from the hall. It had been carried out and had been dashed savagely against the garden wall, under which its splintered fragments were discovered. Holmes rubbed his hands. This is certainly very novel, said he. I thought it would please you. But I have not got to the end yet. Dr. Barnicott was due at his surgery at twelve o'clock, and you can imagine his amazement when, on arriving there, he found that the window had been opened in the night, 
and that the broken pieces of his second bust were strewn all over the room. It had been smashed to atoms where it stood. In neither case were there any signs which could give us a clue as to the criminal or lunatic who had done the mischief. Now, Mr. Holmes, you have got the facts. They are singular, not to say grotesque, said Holmes. May I ask whether the two busts smashed in Dr. Barnicott's rooms were the exact duplicates of the one which was destroyed in Morse Hudson's shop? They were taken from the same mold. Such a fact must tell against the theory that the man who breaks them is influenced by any general hatred of Napoleon. Considering how many hundreds of statues of the great emperor must exist in London, it is too much to suppose such a coincidence as that a promiscuous iconoclast should chance to begin upon three specimens of the same bust. Well, I thought as you do, said Lestrade. On the other hand, this Morse Hudson is the purveyor of busts in that part of London, and these three were the only ones which had been in his shop for years. So, although, as you say, there are many hundreds of statues in London, it is very probable that these three were the only ones in that district. Therefore, a local fanatic would begin with them. What do you think, Dr. Watson? There are no limits to the possibilities of monomania, I answered. There is the condition which the modern French psychologists have called the idée fixe, which may be trifling in character, and accompanied by complete sanity in every other way. A man who had read deeply about Napoleon, or who had possibly received some hereditary family injury through the Great War, might conceivably form such an idée fixe and under its influence be capable of any fantastic outrage. That won't do, my dear Watson, said Holmes, shaking his head, for no amount of idée fixe would enable your interesting monomaniac to find out where these busts were situated. Well, how do you explain it? I don't attempt to do so. I would only observe that there is a certain method in the gentleman's eccentric proceedings. For example, in Dr. Barnicott's hall, where a sound might arouse the family, the bust was taken outside before being broken, whereas in the surgery, where there was less danger of an alarm, it was smashed where it stood. The affair seems absurdly trifling, and yet I dare call nothing trivial when I reflect that some of my most classic cases have had the least promising commencement. You will remember, Watson, how the dreadful business of the Abernity family was first brought to my notice by the depth which the parsley had sunk into the butter upon a hot day. I can't afford, therefore, to smile at your three broken busts, Lestrade, and I shall be very much obliged to you if you will let me hear of any fresh developments of so singular a chain of events. The development for which my friend had asked came in a quicker and an infinitely more tragic form than he could have imagined. I was still dressing in my bedroom next morning when there was a tap at the door and Holmes entered, a telegram in his hand. He read it aloud. Come instantly, 131, Pitt Street, Kensington. Lestrade. What is it, then? I asked. Don't know, maybe anything. But I suspect it is the sequel of the story of the statues. In that case our friend, the image breaker, has begun operations in another quarter of London. There's coffee on the table, Watson, and I have a cab at the door. In half an hour we had reached Pitt Street, a quiet little backwater just beside one of the briskest currents of London life. Number 131 was one of a row, all flat-chested, respectable, and most unromantic dwellings. As we drove up we found the railings in front of the house lined by a curious crowd. Holmes whistled. By George. It's attempted murder at the least. Nothing less will hold the London message boy. There's a deed of violence indicated in that fellow's round shoulders and outstretched neck. What's this, Watson? The top step swillied down and the other one's dry. Footsteps enough, anyhow. Well, well, there's Lestrade at the front window, and we shall soon know all about it. The official received us with a very grave face and showed us into a sitting room, where an exceedingly unkempt and agitated elderly man, 
clad in a flannel dressing gown, was pacing up and down. He was introduced to us as the owner of the house, Mr. Horace Harker, of the Central Press Syndicate. It's the Napoleon bust business again, said Lestrade. You seemed interested last night, Mr. Holmes, so I thought perhaps you would be glad to be present now that the affair has taken a very much graver turn. What has it turned to, then? To murder. Mr. Harker, will you tell these gentlemen exactly what has occurred? The man in the dressing gown turned upon us with a most melancholy face. It's an extraordinary thing, said he, that all my life I have been collecting other people's news, and now that a real piece of news has come my own way I am so confused and bothered that I can't put two words together. If I had come in here as a journalist I should have interviewed myself and had two columns in every evening paper. As it is I am giving away valuable copy by telling my story over and over to a string of different people, and I can make no use of it myself. However, I've heard your name, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and if you'll only explain this queer business I shall be paid for my trouble in telling you the story. Holmes sat down and listened. It all seems to center round that bust of Napoleon which I bought for this very room about four months ago. I picked it up cheap from Harding Brothers, two doors from the High Street Station. A great deal of my journalistic work is done at night, and I often write until the early morning. So it was today. I was sitting in my den, which is at the back of the top of the house, about three o'clock, when I was convinced that I heard some sounds downstairs. I listened but they were not repeated, and I concluded that they came from outside. Then suddenly, about five minutes later, there came a most horrible yell, the most dreadful sound, Mr. Holmes, that ever I heard. It will ring in my ears as long as I live. I sat frozen with horror for a minute or two. Then I seized the poker and went downstairs. When I entered this room I found the window wide open, and I at once observed that the bust was gone from the mantelpiece. Why any burglar should take such a thing passes my understanding, for it was only a plaster cast and of no real value whatever. You can see for yourself that anyone going out through that open window could reach the front doorstep by taking a long stride. This was clearly what the burglar had done, so I went round and opened the door. Stepping out into the dark I nearly fell over a dead man who was lying there. I ran back for a light and there was the poor fellow, a great gash in his throat and the whole place swimming in blood. He lay on his back, his knees drawn up, and his mouth horribly open. I shall see him in my dreams. I had just time to blow on my police whistle, and then I must have fainted, for I knew nothing more until I found the policeman standing over me in the hall. Well, who was the murdered man? asked Holmes. There's nothing to show who he was, said Lestrade. You shall see the body at the mortuary, but we have made nothing of it up to now. He is a tall man, sunburned, very powerful, not more than thirty. He is poorly dressed, and yet does not appear to be a laborer. A horn-handled clasp knife was lying in a pool of blood beside him. Whether it was the weapon which did the deed, or whether it belonged to the dead man, I do not know. There was no name on his clothing, and nothing in his pockets save an apple, some string, a shilling map of London, and a photograph. Here it is. It was evidently taken by a snapshot from a small camera. It represented an alert, sharp-featured simian man with thick eyebrows, and a very peculiar projection of the lower part of the face like the muzzle of a baboon. And what became of the bust? asked Holmes after a careful study of this picture. We had news of it just before you came. It has been found in the front garden of an empty house in Campton House Road. It was broken into fragments. I am going round now to see it. Will you come? Certainly. I must just take one look round. He examined the carpet and the window. The fellow had either very long legs or was a most active man, said he. With an area beneath, 
it was no mean feat to reach that window ledge and open that window. Getting back was comparatively simple. Are you coming with us to see the remains of your bust, Mr. Harker? The disconsolate journalist had seated himself at a writing table. I must try and make something of it, said he, though I have no doubt that the first editions of the evening papers are out already with full details. It's like my luck. You remember when the stand fell at Doncaster? Well, I was the only journalist in the stand, and my journal the only one that had no account of it, for I was too shaken to write it. And now I'll be too late with a murder done on my own doorstep. As we left the room we heard his pen traveling shrilly over the fool's cap. The spot where the fragments of the bust had been found was only a few hundred yards away. For the first time our eyes rested upon this presentment of the great emperor, which seemed to raise such frantic and destructive hatred in the mind of the unknown. It lay scattered in splintered shards upon the grass. Holmes picked up several of them and examined them carefully. I was convinced from his intent face and his purposeful manner that at last he was upon a clue. Well, asked Lestrade. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. We have a long way to go yet, said he. And yet, and yet, well, we have some suggestive facts to act upon. The possession of this trifling bust was worth more in the eyes of this strange criminal than a human life. That is one point. Then there is the singular fact that he did not break it in the house, or immediately outside the house, if to break it was his sole object. He was rattled and bustled by meeting this other fellow. He hardly knew what he was doing. Well, that's likely enough. But I wish to call your attention very particularly to the position of this house in the garden of which the bust was destroyed. Lestrade looked about him. It was an empty house, and so he knew that he would not be disturbed in the garden. Yes, but there is another empty house farther up the street which he must have passed before he came to this one. Why did he not break it there, since it is evident that every yard that he carried it increased the risk of someone meeting him? I give it up, said Lestrade. Holmes pointed to the street lamp above our heads. He could see what he was doing here and he could not there. That was his reason. By Jove! That's true, said the detective. Now that I come to think of it, Dr. Barnicott's bust was broken not far from his red lamp. Well, Mr. Holmes, what are we to do with that fact? to remember it, to docket it. We may come on something later which will bear upon it. What steps do you propose to take now, Lestrade? The most practical way of getting at it, in my opinion, is to identify the dead man. There should be no difficulty about that. When we have found who he is and who his associates are, we should have a good start in learning what he was doing in Pitt Street last night and who it was who met him and killed him on the doorstep of Mr. Horace Harker. Don't you think so? No doubt, and yet it is not quite the way in which I should approach the case. What would you do, then? Oh, you must not let me influence you in any way. I suggest that you go on your line and I on mine. We can compare notes afterwards, and each will supplement the other. Very good, said Lestrade. If you are going back to Pitt Street you might see Mr. Horace Harker. Tell him from me that I have quite made up my mind, and that it is certain that a dangerous homicidal lunatic with Napoleonic delusions was in his house last night. It will be useful for his article. Lestrade stared. You don't seriously believe that? Holmes smiled. Don't I? Well, perhaps I don't. But I am sure that it will interest Mr. Horace Harker and the subscribers of the Central Press Syndicate.
Now, Watson, I think that we shall find that we have a long and rather complex day's work before us. I should be glad, Lestrade, if you could make it convenient to meet us at Baker Street at six o'clock this evening. Until then I should like to keep this photograph found in the dead man's pocket. It is possible that I may have to ask your company and assistance upon a small expedition which will have be undertaken tonight, if my chain of reasoning should prove to be correct. Until then, goodbye and good luck. Sherlock Holmes and I walked together to the high street, where he stopped at the shop of Harding Brothers, whence the bust had been purchased. A young assistant informed us that Mr. Harding would be absent until afternoon, and that he was himself a newcomer who could give us no information. Holmes's face showed his disappointment and annoyance. Well, well, we can't expect to have it all our own way, Watson, he said, at last. We must come back in the afternoon if Mr. Harding will not be here until then. I am, as you have no doubt surmised, endeavoring to trace these busts to their source, in order to find if there is not something peculiar which may account for their remarkable fate. Let us make for Mr. Morse Hudson, of the Kennington Road, and see if he can throw any light upon the problem. A drive of an hour brought us to the picture dealer's establishment. He was a small, stout man with a red face and a peppery manner. Yes, sir. On my very counter, sir, said he. What we pay rates and taxes for I don't know, when any ruffian can come in and break one's goods. Yes, sir, it was I who sold Dr. Barnicott his two statues. Disgraceful, sir. A nihilist plot, that's what I make it. No one but an anarchist would go about breaking statues. Red Republicans, that's what I call them. Who did I get the statues from? I don't see what that has to do with it. Well, if you really want to know, I got them from Gelder and Company, in Church Street, Stepney. They are a well-known house in the trade, and have been this twenty years. How many had I? Three, two and one or three, two of Dr. Barnicott's and one smashed in broad daylight on my own counter. Do I know that photograph? No, I don't. Yes, I do, though. Why, it's Beppo. He was a kind of Italian piecework man, who made himself useful in the shop. He could carve a bit in gild and frame, and do odd jobs. The fellow left me last week, and I've heard nothing of him since. No, I don't know where he came from nor where he went to. I have nothing against him while he was here. He was gone two days before the bust was smashed. Well, that's all we could reasonably expect to get from Morse Hudson, said Holmes, as we emerged from the shop. We have this Beppo as a common factor, both in Kennington and in Kensington, so that is worth a ten-mile drive. Now, Watson, let us make for Gelder and Company, of Stepney, the source and origin of busts. I shall be surprised if we don't get some help down there. In rapid succession we pass through the fringe of fashionable London, Hotel London, Theatrical London, Literary London, Commercial London, and, finally, Maritime London, till we came to a riverside city of a hundred thousand souls, where the tenement houses swelter and reek with the outcasts of Europe. Here, in a broad thoroughfare, once the abode of wealthy city merchants, we found the sculpture works for which we searched. Outside was a considerable yard full of monumental masonry. Inside was a large room in which fifty workers were carving or molding. The manager, a big blonde German, received us civilly and gave a clear answer to all Holmes's questions. A reference to his books showed that hundreds of casts had been taken from a marble copy of Davine's Head of Napoleon, but that the three which had been sent to Morse Hudson a year or so before had been half of a batch of six, the other three being sent to Harding Brothers, of Kensington. There was no reason why those six should be different to any of the other casts. He could suggest no possible cause why anyone should wish to destroy them, in fact, he laughed at the idea. Their wholesale price was six shillings, but the retailer would get twelve or more. The cast was taken in two molds from each side of the face, and then these two profiles of plaster of Paris were joined together to make the complete bust. The work was usually done by Italians in the room we were in. 
When finished the busts were put on a table in the passage to dry, and afterwards stored. That was all he could tell us. But the production of the photograph had a remarkable effect upon the manager. His face flushed with anger, and his brows knotted over his blue Teutonic eyes. Ah, the rascal, he cried. Yes, indeed, I know him very well. This has always been a respectable establishment, and the only time that we have ever had the police in it was over this very fellow. It was more than a year ago now. He knifed another Italian in the street, and then he came to the works with the police on his heels, and he was taken here. Beppo was his name, his second name I never knew. Serve me right for engaging a man with such a face. But he was a good workman, one of the best. What did he get? The man lived and he got off with a year. I have no doubt he is out now, but he has not dared to show his nose here. We have a cousin of his here, and I dare say he could tell you where he is. No, no, cried Holmes, not a word to the cousin, not a word, I beg you. The matter is very important, and the farther I go with it the more important it seems to grow. When you referred in your ledger to the sale of those casts I observed that the date was June 3rd of last year. Could you give me the date when Beppo was arrested? I could tell you roughly by the pay list, the manager answered. Yes, he continued, after some turning over of pages, he was paid last on May 20th. Thank you, said Holmes. I don't think that I need intrude upon your time and patience anymore. With a last word of caution that he should say nothing as to our researches we turned our faces westward once more. The afternoon was far advanced before we were able to snatch a hasty luncheon at a restaurant. A news bill at the entrance announced Kensington outrage. Murder by a madman, and the contents of the paper showed that Mr. Horace Harker had got his account into print after all. Two columns were occupied with a highly sensational and flowery rendering of the whole incident. Holmes propped it against the cruet stand and read it while he ate. Once or twice he chuckled. This is all right, Watson, said he. Listen to this, it is satisfactory to know that there can be no difference of opinion upon this case, since Mr. Lestrade, one of the most experienced members of the official force, and Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the well-known consulting expert, have each come to the conclusion that the grotesque series of incidents, which have ended in so tragic a fashion, arise from lunacy rather than from deliberate crime. No explanation save mental aberration can cover the facts. The press, Watson, is a most valuable institution if you only know how to use it. And now, if you have quite finished, we will hark back to Kensington and see what the manager of Harding Brothers has to say to the matter. The founder of that great emporium proved to be a brisk, crisp little person, very dapper and quick, with a clear head and a ready tongue. Yes, sir, I have already read the account in the evening papers. Mr. Horace Harker is a customer of ours. We supplied him with the bust some months ago. We ordered three busts of that sort from Gelder and Company, of Stepney. They are all sold now. To whom? Oh, I dare say by consulting our sales book we could very easily tell you. Yes, we have the entries here. One to Mr. Harker, you see, and one to Mr. Josiah Brown, of Laburnum Lodge, Laburnum Vale, Chiswick, and one to Mr. Sandiford, of Lower Grove Road, reading. No, I have never seen this face which you show me in the photograph. You would hardly forget it, would you, sir, for I've seldom seen an uglier. Have we any Italians on the staff? Yes, sir, we have several among our workpeople and cleaners. I dare say they might get a peep at that sales book if they wanted to. There is no particular reason for keeping a watch upon that book. Well, well, it's a very strange business, and I hope that you'll let me know if anything comes of your inquiries. Holmes had taken several notes during Mr. Harding's evidence, and I could see that he was thoroughly satisfied by the turn which affairs were taking. 
He made no remark, however, save that, unless we hurried, we should be late for our appointment with Lestrade. Sure enough, when we reached Baker Street the detective was already there, and we found him pacing up and down in a fever of impatience. His look of importance showed that his day's work had not been in vain. Well, he asked. What luck, Mr. Holmes? We have had a very busy day, and not entirely a wasted one, my friend explained. We have seen both the retailers and also the wholesale manufacturers. I can trace each of the busts now from the beginning. The busts, cried Lestrade. Well, well, you have your own methods, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and it is not for me to say a word against them, but I think I have done a better day's work than you. I have identified the dead man.